Um, so first, I definitely want to give a huge thank you to Jared and Megan uh, for partnering up with us and making this all possible. So I really just want to thank you. Also, another special thank you to, uh, to Emmett Frank, who's stepping down from the editorial board, but he has done so much legwork to make this happen. So a special thank you to you as well. And all of you, again. <laughs> um, so to give you a little bit of background, because I know we have folks that aren't just from the Dartmouth community here, um, Clementis is a, uh, Clementis the Mouse Journal is a biannual publication for the Masters of Arts in Liberal Studies, or the Mouse Program. At Dartmouth, the journal aims to showcase the strongest pieces of creative and critical writing submitted by MAL students, uh, MAL's alumni, and Guarini graduate students in general. By selecting and integrating work from all four concentrations, uh, creative writing, cultural studies, uh, general arts, and uh, globalization, um, uh, and from the, uh, uh, the uh, greater Guarini community, uh, we endeavor to promote intellectual engagement, fruitful questions, uh, and honest discourse within the realm of liberal studies. And just to give you a, a sense of the organization for this evening, uh, the reading order will be Jim Washington, Emmett Frank, Jasmine Shirey, Howard Carter, and finally, Michael Wiener. Um, just a reminder to the readers, you all have about approximately 10 minutes, so we'll give you a little nudge uh, from the back somewhere um, if you're uh, going by that, uh, past that. Um, and then one last thing for the audience in general, if you're really enjoying something you're reading or just wanna read anything in general, we have a bunch of copies of Clementis over there for, your, uh, <laughs> uh, for you to enjoy. And yeah, Maria. Okay, our first reader is Jim Washington. Uh, Jim Washington lives in Hanover, New Hampshire with his wife, Mary Lee, and is a Dartmouth undergraduate admissions staff member. His education includes a Master of Arts, writing poetry earned at the University of New Hampshire where his faculty mentors included Charles Simic and Mikhail McBride. Jim's poems have appeared in the Anthology of New England Writers, Blood Fruit Literary Magazine, College Poetry Review, Evansville Review, Journal of Progressive Human Services, Lowell Review, Main Street Rag, Oyster River Anthology, Rattle, Red Brick Review, and others. He plans to complete his math degree study by 2023. It's just uh, passing off to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really nice introduction. Uh, and I was barely a block or two away from here. And uh, there was some of the closest lightning I've ever seen to my, my car in my lifetime. And I go, you really have to like poetry to go out on an evening today. <laughs> so I'm here, so that shows that I really like poetry. Um, I'm going to do uh, two short poems uh, from uh, a publication, uh, Main Street Rag, uh, and leave my third poem to be from Comantis, okay? Um, the uh, first one I'm gonna start with, uh, is hopefully something people can uh, get a sense of if they've ever gone to a diner. So diners, they call me hun, trip fingers along my shoulder and show me the best laminated bargains, leaning in tight. Sometimes I wanna crush fidelity along with all the moralistic teachings, even though I could get the same over easy, drain the grease, no hash browns at home. This one has a little bit of a, a different tone um, and it's part autobiographical uh, and it's a poem that uh, has my mother in it. Uh, and it's important for me to say to you, uh, my mother is deceased, uh, but I truly respect my mother, uh, and she was my best friend. Uh, and sometimes I try to write uh, things that I think she would have wanted me to see, to, to, to write. I'm not sure this is one of them, but we'll give it a go. It's called Low Down Kryptonite. Back when we still had phone booths, 
the kind that brought Superman out of Clark Kent. My mom entered one after a swing fest with my grandma and came out with someone else. Her bladder having failed after quick stepping off the city bus for a public bathroom too far into a functional neighborhood and her hanging on to a telephone, even I knew had no one on the other end. When she relieved herself, piss and alcohol on the run from the base of the vertical box. We left with no one to call and her just chattering away. So now for the Mantis one. Uh, this requires just a little setup. Uh, this is from, uh, I, I watched the fight back in 1990 on television and no one had the sense to do it because it was such a mismatch. It was a championship match between Mike Tyson and a guy named uh, Buster Douglas. And it was one for the ages. It turned out to be far better than Bill. And a writer named Joe Lane has termed it the last great fight. So I'll give you my take on, uh, on this boxing match. It's called Buster Smile. And this was uh, Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson. It was February 11, 1990. So it starts with a quote by the champ. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that was Mike Tyson, 32nd lineal heavyweight boxing champion. Until that fight, Buster's nickname was mostly ironic, but this time he fought with his just dead mother inside. No shows made the Tokyo Dome cavernous, even quiet enough to hear the champ, Tyson, comfortable in his own dry skin, snicker at the ritual touch gloves before rounds piled heavy the weight on Iron Mike until his squash hubris left him only strong enough to reach from the knees for a mouthpiece, tumbling and tumbling across a canvas with no smile inside. Thank you. Our next reader is Emmett Frank. Emmett Frank is a creative writing student in the Mouse program at Dartmouth College. Emmett enjoys writing humorous stories about nature and drawing inspiration from those little moments that often go unnoticed in our day-to-day -day lives. Writing is an exploration and adventure that he enjoys pursuing through both nonfiction and fiction prose. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this piece today, especially since it is raining. And it's a little bit thematic because uh, this piece is called A Flood of Memories. <laughs> I thought it was the pounding rain on the roof that woke me last night until I heard three soft electronic chirps. A thin band of light penetrated the shades of my bedroom window, followed by the roar of tires fighting against the flooded road outside. After the car had passed, I strained my ears to locate the origins of the chirping noise. Believing it to be a smoke detector, I reluctantly rose from the warm comfort of my covers to investigate. I kept the lights off as I roamed through the kitchen and living room, listening intently for three consecutive trills. I explored every nook of the single-story house to no avail. Giving up on my search, I returned to bed and let the rain soothe me back to sleep. Silence greeted me the next morning. The rain had petered off before dawn and golden sunbeams were now beating against my blinds. I began my morning routine by starting the kettle boiling and surveying my backyard through the kitchen window. I was amazed to see the yard's transformation, the mountains of snow that had been reduced to low plateaus. Small rivers carved canyons through the icy glaciers, revealing green patches of grass. I felt encouraged by this small demonstration of spring. 
Two robins pecked at the dormant ground as they danced around a large branch that had fallen in the storm. Convincing myself that it was necessary to remove that branch from the yard, I left the house. I took a moment to breathe in the clean and mild air. The robins abandoned their morning hunt to watch as I wrestled the large branch over the small stone wall at the edge of my yard. Heading back towards the house, I noticed a small stream had formed. The trickle passed through the snow piles before branching into miniature tributaries and deltas that fed into a large lake on my patio and the abutting basement window. I sprinted back inside the house. I threw open the basement door, descending the stairs two steps at a time until I splashed into the aquifer at the bottom. With no drain underneath the concrete floor, the water had slowly filled the basement overnight and now covered the tops of my boots. Cardboard boxes left over from the move-in two years ago sagged against the water surrounding them. The smell of soggy cardboard permeated the space. Unpacking the boxes was a chore. I had successfully deferred until now. Sitting on top of a stool next to the boxes was the culprit of the nighttime chirping. A light flashed steadily on the front of the dehumidifier to remind me to empty its full bucket. The soft chirping was the dehumidifier's pitiful war cry in its fight against the onslaught of moisture. I donned a headlamp to help me see in the dimly lit basement. The narrow beam of light exposed the moisture and musk emanating from the liquid floor. Trying not to inhale too deeply, I hastily grabbed the nearest box and hoisted it on top of a rickety workbench. The bench swayed as I tore at the saturated cardboard. The soft walls of the box caved inward to reveal a pile of old clothing. I had intended to donate, but I unfolded a well-worn t-shirt near the top. A white graphic of a bird in mid-flight adorned the front. A bodiless hand controlled the bird's flight with marionette strings attached to its wings. The cotton felt as soft as silk as my hands traced between holes that should have earned the shirt a place in the trash can. But I set the shirt aside and pulled more boxes out of the deluge. Ruined boxes of junk, too trivial to unpack from the flood, became treasure chests to me. I waded through boxes and memories. I uncovered an iPod from high school with earpods still wrapped tightly around its enclosure. I was delighted to find that it's still charged and I thrust the earbuds into my ears to block out the unabating sound of dripping water. The time capsule to my teenage musical taste became the soundtrack to my rescue mission. I plucked a three-dimensional apple puzzle from one of the last boxes. Each of the unique red painted pieces interlocked together around a solid core. I shook my head as I remembered how my grandmother had always placed it precariously close to the edge of her coffee table. Feigning surprise when one of her grandchildren knocked it to the floor, she would admonish the offender and ask them to put the 40 piece puzzle back together. I placed the apple carefully on top of the nearby washer and backed away. With the boxes salvaged, I attacked the source of the flood by redirecting the river from, from my house. As I shoveled a trench around the perimeter of the patio, I was reminded of a game I played as a child. My friends and I would dig our booted heels into the mud around a large pool and channel the water into new puddles. The goal was to build the largest puddle. The professed victor would have the privilege of jumping into their puddle with both feet to splash the losers and any other unfortunate bystanders. The losers would jump into their own puddles anyway, so it was hard to determine the actual way. I couldn't help but laugh at the idea of jumping into the puddle that was now in my basement. After diverting the source of the flood, I emptied the water out of the basement, first dipping the rim of a small bucket below the surface to let the water fill the container, and then migrating the contents into a larger five gallon bucket. Heaving the bucket upstairs and outside, I would pour out the intruding water. Every trip to dump the water outside was an opportunity to enjoy the early spring day. Despite the nuisance of the flood, I felt richer for having recovered the memories trapped inside the boxes. As I finished mopping up the last of the water, I realized I had finally finished unpacking. The basement was clear. No more boxes crowded the floors, which now had a gentle sheen of moisture. I reinserted the empty bucket of the dehumidifier and received a chirp in return as it went back to work and I returned upstairs. Thank you.
Our next reader is Howard Carter. Howard Carter is an attorney, has degrees from Boston University, MCLA, Dartmouth College, and Albany Law School. Howard is a retired U.S. Navy Master Chief who spent 22 years in the Navy SEAL teams. Howard is a veteran of the Bosnia Kosovo Campaign, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom Trans-Sahara. Howard worked with indigenous forces in 25 nations during his time in service. Howard Carter. Thank you. So um, here's another outfit that Kennedy created in the 60s, the SEAL teams. And this is a picture of uh, my squad during the time frame that I'm about ready to discuss. It's the, uh, this is a work of fiction that I put together. It's a conglomeration of, some, of a variety of missions that I've been on in my career. Uh, names have been changed, but it gives you an idea. It's a critique of it all in a way. And the name of the piece, the fiction piece is called Ants and Scorpions. Jeff and I were patrolling at night on the Columbia Panama border, a river laden roadless region that had been a bombing range for our air force during World War II. Now, 50 years later, we discovered a crater in the jungle floor, an old bomb hole that made perfect cover for our reconnaissance. The hole was on a finger that jutted into El Rio Atrato from the south, providing dead space to the water on our west flank. The enemy, members of the 57th Regiment of the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, were encamped on the riverbank to the east. We were about 100 yards from the target. During the night, we watched the target from our bomb hole. I looked at Jeff as I handed him a night vision camera lens. He was a short and strong Navy chief with a balding blonde head, chiseled chin, and cliche penetrating blue eyes. My boss for the last five years. We both had on woodland fatigues and floppy hats that were well worn and dirty. The dirtier you are, the more you blend in. We were looking for the leader of this regiment of revolutionaries, Antonio Vidal. The mission was to capture Vidal once we had established his pattern of life. This was a joint operation that involved both Colombian and American forces. Jeff attached the lens and began to take pictures. Prior to first light, we covered our optics with pantyhose attached by rubber bands. This technique dulled the glint of the glass and scope shadow that could give away our position when day came. It's an old trick of the reconnaissance trade. Magnified lenses punch through small holes and fabrics of stockings, while the fabric blocks the glint from the sun. We had rubbed fresh camouflage paint on each other's exposed skin. The FARC camp came into naked eye view at dawn. Their makeshift encampment sprawled 50 yards along the Rio Atrato. It was a hasty bivouac, made up of mostly black trash bags strung in trees with some tarps and ponchos. Their officer, officers occupied the one thatched roof hut built by native fishermen. A few campesinos appeared from trash bag tents and began starting fires to set camp for breakfast. We took pictures of the men through our high powered optics as they began to boil water and prepare fish. Peacock, peacock bass was a favorite, but an introduced population of freshwater osters was starting to dominate the basin. No doubt that parasite population of osters was introduced by foreigners who at one time fished the local rivers of the Darien Gap before the FARC dominated this region. Fishing tourism eroded as kidnapping foreigners for ransom became common. The rest of the FARC camp awoke at dawn. The watchman who had slept through his shift acted dumb when approached by his officer. El Capitan barked orders and the group of about 20 armed campesinos formed a line into the jungle. First patrol of the day wore green uniforms and black berets. They shouted in unison as they locked and loaded the Leal rifles. Viva la revolucion, carajo, ni un paso atrás. Then the patrol marched into the darkness of the Darien Gap triple canopy jungle. They disappeared past massive tree trunks and sprawling man-high silk cotton buttress roots that jutted out of the jungle floor. I picked up the radio handset with my thin black leather gloved hand. Show no skin, skin shines in light. 
Then I sent an activity report to our headquarters. As first light came, Jeff and I thought we heard a slight rain beginning to fall, the crackling of leaves and fauna in, on, and above the jungle floor. The rains in this part of Columbia had a habit of creeping up on you with a sprinkle during the dry season. We heard the crack crackling rain-like sounds quietly at first, but it grew louder. Then, suddenly, the ants began falling on us from above, like raindrops. Tank ants with reddish-orange bodies, broad heads, and long pinchers. Pinchers that could cut prey, cut leaves and capture prey. A menacing scout patrol of ants. We bit our lips. An army of ants soon followed. The half-inch long creatures created a torrent of biting earth. They gushed into our makeshift fox foxhole. It was a red and belligerent swath, like an active stream that appeared and disappeared in the jungle behind us. The swath of ants was about a yard wide and flowed as far as we could see south into the dense jungle of the Darien. They swept us out of our hole and off to one side of each other with the ant river in the middle. The ants were close enough to see the torsos, the hairs on their torsos. It was getting brighter now and we were forced out of our hole. The dense jungle of the Darien Gap still provided some concealment, but we watched as the FARC commander looked through binoculars towards our location. We pressed our bodies against the floor of the jungle. With green painted faces, we flashed teeth at each other across the river of ants. All the while, the ant army kept coming from under the darkness of the triple canopy. The ants were flowing, flowing by the black palm now near our location. Then the monkeys awakened and began howling. From the trees, they always howled in the mornings. The tropical sun was not yet fully upon us, but it would be soon. The Ant River continued as the FARC commander put down his optics and sat down to eat breakfast. I was taking pictures of the commander eating when a dark flicker to my immediate right caught my eye. Jeff and I both saw it, perhaps at the same time. A black scorpion had climbed up on a root sticking straight out of the jungle floor. The scorpion was over the Ant River that separated Jeff and I. It was a large scorpion, about four inches long. The armored arachnid shifted about on a tiny bend at the top of the root. It was flicking its stinger nervously contemplating the carpet of ants below. The scorpion looked prehistoric as it teetered and shifted on its twig-like root perch. There had to have been millions that, made, millions that made up the ant river below. Jeff and I watched intently for a few moments, looking at each other and between us at the ants and the scorpion. But the pictures, we have to keep taking the pictures. So on each side of the Ant River with the trapped scorpion, Jeff and I lay quietly looking through optics, sending reports on our radio and taking pictures of the camp. There were native watermen stopping by the camp now, picking up blue 55 gallon drums with their dugout canoes and other small craft, drums full of coca paste. You could hear the life of the boat traffic on the many tributaries coming to life now. A part of the cocaine highway heading north to American cities and towns. All the while, we glanced with morbid fascination at the ant tort and the scorpion imprisoned on the twig, twig root above. We pushed our camera, radio, carbines, and optics into some low-lying brush as it got brighter. We set makeshift concealment by gently sticking fauna in the ground around us, all while listening to the monkeys, watching the ants, the encampment, the campesino fishing boats, and that damn black scorpion stuck on the twig root. Jeff and I were still both about four feet on either side of that scorpion, the scorpion between us and above the ants. The ant army continued moving through us like a mean orangish red stream. It was a flash flood of ants that moved through us towards El Rio Atrato. Still no sign of Antonio Vidal as the ants flowed below the scorpion. We lay silent, watching and listening to the camp within the crackling raindrop sounds of the ant river. We took pictures while scribbling our observations on waterproof paper. Then, Jeff did a curious thing. He picked up a small stick and he swept the scorpion from its twig-like root perch. It fell into the river of the ants. In less than a second, that black scorpion was gone. It snapped its tail once with an audible click within the crackling of ants and was then devoured. The ants enveloped it like rust-colored water, like a lobster going into a boiling pot. The scorpion is prey, not predator. We continued after the death of the scorpion still quiet and mostly hidden. Driven from our hole in the ground, taking our pictures, our pictures, our pictures, our pictures without a sound, 
watching the ants, watching the camp. That is when we heard machetes cutting brush. The patrol of revolutionaries we watched leave the camp at dawn was moving toward us, unseen but close enough to hear. Time to beat feet. Close to the earth, we quickly, quietly bundled our gear and inflated our UDT life jackets. Once ready to move, Jeff crouched and made a deliberate slow step over the ants to get to my side. Then we slid on our valleys down the bank into the water along the dead space of our west, of our west flank. In the water, we picked our way through tall grass in the defilade, moving away from the encamp encampment and the patrol. We moved a couple hundred yards through the water to be separated from immediate compromise, hiding in the reeds from the boat traffic when it passed by. Then we crawled out on the riverbank. Once my feet were dry, I reached into my waterproof bag. I retrieved the handset and winced as I brushed aside some ants that had hitched a ride. Then I passed the code word for mission abort. We made it to our extract site by noon after patrolling 800 yards. A bend in the river. Three Colombian riverine boats came. Two boats provided overwatch on both ends of the bend, while the third touched the shore to pick us up without being seen. Jeff and I smirked in the midday sun as we hopped on the boat to sit in the concealment below the gunnels. Looking at each other in sweat-laden fatigues, we shook our heads. This is our drug war, ants and scorpions. <laughs> Thank you. Our next reader is Michael Wiener. <laughs> As a writer, performer, actor, educator, and curator, Michael Wiener believes that the spirit of improvisation fuels the mostly the most fully realized incendiary art. <laughs> His writing includes projects as a cultural critic, playwright, performance artist, analogous, and vocalist songwriter. Professionally, he's also worked as an editor and taxonomist. Michael did his undergraduate study at Washington University in St. Louis, a BA in English, cum laude, cum laude in minor history, minor in history. Prior to graduation, Michael began writing as a cultural critic and essayist for the St. Louis Magazine. And he subsequently contributed to numerous New York, New York and national magazines, newspapers, and blogs, including Interview, The Village Voice, Paper, Washington City Paper, Spin, Time Out, MTV Online, Condonet, and many more. He's a MAL student on a creative writing track who embraces the wonderfully interdisciplinary nature of the program. He has performed in a, and produced events at venues across New York City and around the country, including Theater 80 St. Mark's, Roulette, Brashnikov Center, National Arts Club, Soho Repertory, Armory Show, New York Theater Workshop, MoMA PS1, The Kitchen, Brooklyn Museum, Whitney Museum at Altria, St. Anne's Warehouse, here, Ohio Theater, Ace Hotel, Monkey Town, 92nd, Monkey Town, sorry, 92nd Street, Y, New Dramatist, Pictures, sorry, New Dramatist, Pictures Release, sorry, Dramatist Prelude, French Festivals, La Mama, Galapagos, Dixon Place, Film Work includes Magnolia Pictures Release, Hal Satan, Sundance, and Comic Con favorite Stingray Sam, and a Clio awarding, awarding Drug Awareness PSA directed by Darnin Aronofsky. Recent collaborators include Ben Williams, John Reed, Tony Tom, White Horse Theater, Sybil Kempson, Liz Magic Laser, and the Avant Rock Music Ensemble, The Children, featuring members of Swans, Cop Shoot Cop, and Bark Market. Recently <clears throat> signed to the Eric Tots decoding label with an LP release forthcoming late 2022. In May, you will appear as Cadmus in a Dartmouth Theatre Department stage reading of Euripides, the back eight written and directed by August Gaskowski. Michael Wiener. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, thanks for reading that whole thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, um, so uh, let me just find this. It's, this is a excerpt of a screenplay that I wrote here um, under Professor Phillips. And uh, it is uh, drawn from my experience um, working as a um, working at teaching, running an English department in an ultra Orthodox yeshiva, college prep yeshiva, uh, as, a, as I put it, cosmopolitan Jew. And, um, and it's kind of about the character's uh, experience and then also the kind of juxtaposed against the character's lifestyle and adventures and, mis and social misadventures in New York City. So, uh, and, this, and this is called The Interlude. Interior freshman classroom day. All classrooms, including this one, have been decorated in celebration of the traditional Purim spiel, a day of satire, masquerade, and hijinks in celebration of the historic defeat of the reviled Persian official Haman, who attempted a Jewish purge and failed. The boys have been up all night in giddy preparation. Charles enters the room with difficulty. The lights are off. The desks have been bunched on either side of the room uh, as if the Red Sea has parted. There's a rudimentary drawing of Charles on the, back, on the blackboard, reading glasses and all. Construction paper in every color of the rainbow has been taped to the walls and even over the windows, and the boys have crafted collages, giddy amalgams of hip hop culture, the NFL, the NBA, pop music, basically everything they couldn't get away with normally. They built towers of textbooks on top of the desk and draped a sheet across the divide. Some of them are hanging out inside this cave, dressed like rabbis. Others are wearing football jerseys, lurking on the other side of the room, behind the sheet. A football sails across the room, almost hit Charles in the head. The ceiling light blinks on and off. Chaos. Sevi. Mr. Viner, so what do you think of our Purim spiel? Charles. I'm truly impressed, Greenfield. I mean that sincerely. Really? Really? You stay up all night to pull this off? Pretty much. I mean, I didn't, but some of these guys did. Got to get the beauty rest. You know what I mean, Mr. Viner? I do, Zevi. I do. And uh, who, who are you supposed to be? Sort of my version of Mordecai, Mr. Viner. You know who that is? Uh, of course, Greenfeld. Uh, but why don't you refresh my memory? Come on, Mr. Viner. I want to hear it from you. Uh, what is this, a test? That's not your role, uh, Greenfeld. I'm the teacher here. Educate me on Mordecai. I don't know, Mr. Viner. I'm getting the feeling you have no idea who Mordecai is. Oh, please. This is like the time you confused the Herosa with the Maror when we were talking about Passover. Good thing you didn't, that didn't happen at a Seder. You would have choked. I didn't. The door opens. Rabbi Lieberman pokes his head in, edges his way into the room. Shalom Aleichem, Mr. Viner. Aleichem Shalom, Rabbi Lieberman. Enjoying the Purim spiel? I am. Talk about uh, vivid imaginations. I, I think the uh, Bokram have outdone themselves today. I have to agree. I wouldn't mind a more literal interpretation of the holiday, though. I can only to tolerate so much rap music and major league sports. But it's only one day, after all. They earned it. Greenfeld stands there, just watching, a little out of character. Horowitz sidles up to join him, speechless for once. Charles. If I may get a, a little exegetical, Lieberman. By all means. With all due respect, it strikes me that despite all the trappings of festivity, uh, that this is at its core another tale of vengeance, an eye for an eye holiday. Sometimes I, I wish there were more lessons of forgiveness in the Torah. Leave the vengeance to the Christians. We're the chosen people. I respect your perspective. Sometimes vengeance is necessary. Have I told you my father is a child Holocaust survivor? No. 
did his parents live? They did, and they emigrated to New York City. Beautiful story. After going through all of that, my father uh, decided that he couldn't continue holding on to the hatred. So he dedicated the rest of his, the remainder of his life to forgiveness. He's a bigger man than I. He, uh, just then, the door opens. It's Akiva Ben Saidi, a preternaturally poised freshman who looks about 18, tall with thick black hair and a complexion dark enough to get teased for being black. Five o'clock shadow, charcoal eyes, perpetual smirk. He struts into the room, inserts himself between Charles and Lieberman. Mr. Viner, have you ever worn the tefillin? Of course, it's, it's been a while, why? Today is your lucky day. Do you have a little time for us? Uh, well, um, I, I do have to prepare for, it's Purim, Mr. Viner. Today is a day for Jewishness. No time for English. English doesn't matter. English always matters, I've been saying. Not today, Mr. Viner. Don't worry, we'll help you. It's important. Lieberman hovers nearby, watching Charles. Charles senses his gaze. Okay, Ben Sayed, that's fine. Remind me how to do this? By this time, a surging cluster of boys has gathered in the doorway. Miraculously, the curious ward has not aroused the attention of Rabbi Jaffe, or maybe he's simply not, not around. Charles submits the ritual regardless. Despite the Purim hoopla, the, the room temporarily goes silent as the assembled minion of boys looks on, intent on bear, bearing proper witness. Are you right-handed? Charles nods. Ben Said wraps the leather straps of an arm to fill around his left arm, while another boy brings the head to fill to fill up to his forehead. They murmur passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy reverentially and have him repeat them. Akiva. Baruch Atan Anoi Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitsano B'mitzvah Sav L'Honiak Tefila. Charles. Baruch Atan Anoi Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitsano B'mitzvah Sav Etzivano L'Honiak Tefila. Akiva. Baruch Atan Anoi Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitsano B'mitzvah Tav Etzivano Al Mitzvah Tefila. Charles. The boys then say the Shema and have Charles repeat it. Akiva. Very good, Mr. Viner. Thank you. Now you can have a righteous day. He disappears, and just as suddenly, and as they were flooded into the room, the boys disperse. Charles looks up. Lieberman is gone too. Greenfeld and Horowitz, however, are still standing there. David. Nice going, Mr. Viner. Charles. Thanks, Horowitz. What are you doing for Purim? I don't know yet. It's today. I'm sure I'll do something. Uh, gotta wait and see what uh, kind of invites I get. Too bad I didn't hear from any of you boys. I would have showed up. You serious? Totally, Horowitz. Next time. I'm going to hold you to that, Mr. Viner. Charles makes his way out of the classroom. Thank you. Things. I would say would be has something that they would want to read in the audience. That about wraps things up from our from our readers this evening. Um, I'd like to first uh, Thank all the readers for coming out, especially during this weather, like we've mentioned. So thank you so much for doing all of this. I really appreciate it. Uh, to Jared and Megan, uh, the, the Howe Library for hosting us. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, please get home safely. <laughs> Drive safely. Try. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs>